Full stack development is not just about connecting your backend to frontend using API. Many of the cases with full stack development, we know that we have to do some kind of card operation. We have to create something, read something, update something, delete something into the backend using API from your frontend. But believe me, full stack development is much, much more than that. There are many other peripheral things that as a full stack developer, you have to know because otherwise, if you are joining an organization as a full stack engineer, full stack developer, you have to face those things. Hey, this is Tapas. Welcome back to my channel, Tapas Script. Today, we are going to discuss about one such most important topic from the full stack ecosystem. It's about authentication and authorization. Are authentication and authorization are the same thing? Believe me, they are not. Though the name auth is there in both authentication and authorization, but they are not same. However, they need to be together to make your application more secure. That's what we're going to understand. But never ever take it for granted that authorization and authentication are the same thing. If you are a beginner to authentication and authorization, next 10 minutes are going to teach you all about it. If you know about it already, please go through it still. It will be a brush of things. And if you like this video, please like and share and please subscribe to my channel because it gives me a lot of motivation to do good stuff for you, good content for you. All right, let's get started with authentication first. Have you been to an ATM kiosk to withdraw money? I'm sure you would have. So if you have gone to an ATM kiosk, how do you withdraw money? To withdraw money from your account, you have to provide your card first into the card slot and then you have to give a secret pin to let the ATM machine know that this is the account that belongs to you and you are allowed to withdraw money from it. The ATM machine has a software to verify your card details and the PIN details to determine the person who is providing the PIN is the right person who is supposed to do that. And if the match happen, they will allow you and then you get back the money. So this PIN is a specific secret that is given to you and it should be only known to you or a hacker or a person who would have stolen this PIN. But ideally it should be only known to you so that you can withdraw money from your account. This secret PIN is also called credential. Credential is something that only you should know to let a service know that who you are are you the legitimate person to carry out the action and the operation that you are doing this particular mechanism or letting a service know through a credential is called authentication so in case of atm you authenticate to atm services using that secret pin or credential for any other software what do you do consider this is you and you want to access something from a database or a server a service now you have to let the server or the database know who you are are you the person who should be really granted access or not for that usually you provide something called user id and password right and with the user id and password identity is matched at the backend server and then if your identity is found there you are granted access to do something otherwise you straight away are not provided any kind of access so this methodology of providing user id and password to let the service know that who you are are you the legitimate person is called authentication if things successful you get the access straight away if it is not you get an access denied. This way of authenticating with the user ID and password is known as single factor authentication. This is one of the methodology of authentication called single factor authentication. Usually it is not that great secure. Why? Because we as a human had different pattern in case of managing passwords. We usually don't change our password very often. For many services, we tend to repeat the same password. So it means for a hacker, if they identify one password for one service let's say for gmail it is very very easy for them to use the same password for any other services and gain access on behalf of you so because of all this problem single factor authentication is not that very strong and that's why we are going to talk about another methodology of authentication which is called multi-factor authentication the multi-factor authentication could be of any factor for example it could be two factors it could be three factors what does factor mean let's understand the main idea behind 
behind these jargons like the single factor authentication, multi factor authentication is factor means the different types of authentication that you are doing, but different modes of authentication. One mode of authentication that we have already known is called user ID and password credential based authentication that is single factor authentication. But nowadays, for many of the social media app or you want to buy a food service for any such thing, there is a very famous thing that happens is called OTP, one time password. So even after authenticating using your user ID password, after that, they want to really know like apart from you know the user ID password, are you really the person who is interacting with the system? They send a specific password on your mobile devices through SMS or on email. It could be a simple few digits number that you have to feed into the application along with your user ID password to tell and verify who are you, are you the right person. Person. Nowadays, we also use authenticator app. With the authenticator app, also we get this one-time password from many applications. Giving the credentials using username, password, and second thing about giving the OTP, and together it become two-factor authentication. Sometimes this two-factor authentication also may not be enough, and we want to do more multi-factor authentication. Could you guess what could be another factor, another mode of authentication? That's right. You can do biometric. So nowadays phones specifically, right, they use biometric. There are many applications along with their credentials, along with the OTP that they send you. They also need your thumb impression. Sometimes could be your retina. So this kind of setup for authentication, this multi-factor authentication is pretty, very hard for a hacker to break through, right? So the more methodologies you put the more factors you put to authenticate your users, you make your system that robust, you make your system that that solid. But it is not always feasible, right? For every application, we may not be able to do it because certain things are costly for you to implement. You have to decide like to what extent for your application you can go, to what extent you can implement. Sometimes it might be just user ID password, sometimes it could be user ID password and an OTP, and sometimes could be going to the next stage of doing biometric. Now look around, look around to different applications that you use. For example, an application for chatting service or a social media or even a banking application. In all of this, some of these factors are used. Somewhere they ask for OTP plus your user ID password. Somewhere it is mandatory for do a biometric. So depending on how critical the application is, the mode and the factor of the authentication are decided by the organization to opt for. Now let's see how exactly it works. This is Sam. Hey Sam, how are you? Sam is someone who is like you, who wants to access a service from a server and behind the server there is a database now what sam is saying sam is saying to the server hey server get me that thing now server says that who is this guy who is asking for me let me check in my database whether the guy really exists or not so the server goes back and check to the database hey database can you check whether this guy exists database checks and come back saying that no i didn't find this guy so server goes back and ask bro who are you? I don't know you. That means server is asking Sam to authenticate. Server is asking Sam's that credential so that server can verify Sam is really Sam. Then Sam authenticates and server gets it. And again, server go for checking to the database, retrieving Sam's details so that it can do something. And after the database says that, hey, I found this guy with his credential. Great. So now server sends something very, very sensitive thing, which is called token. So this is to the token, which could be a garbage number. It can be anything. It can be any string that is only belong to the SAM for a particular period of time. So that SAM can exchange this as a key with the server to ask anything further. If SAM is not sending this back, server might reject sam's for the request so sam again sent back the request saying that hey give me that now i am also sending my token so that you can identify me and at the same time i don't have to key in my user id password and credential to you every time instead of that while i'm requesting things to you i'll be passing this token and you will now validate this token and then you will figure out hey this is sam only requesting and if it matches you will give me the thing so sam request and then server goes back fetches the thing server gives back the thing and then finally server returns the thing to sam that's how the authentication takes at a high level now 
If you're confused, go two minutes back, rewind it and watch it again. I'm sure that you will understand how authentication works, how we as user interact with the server, authenticate the server and fetch the details. I hope you understand authentication now and you really enjoyed watching it. By the way, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. And if you like my video so far, please, please, please put the like for this video. All right, next we are going to go to authorization. Let's understand what authorization is with all the concepts that we have learned about authentication. While authentication was the way to tell someone who you are, authorization is the way to get any kind of specific action to do specific tasks on a service. For example, you go to the grocery store, isn't it? And when you go to the grocery store, you can pick up items of your choice and then put it into your cart, go to the checkout counter, pay and check out. That's how as a customer you do. But there will be an area in the grocery store where you are not supposed to get into because that particular area will always be staff only that means if the person is working in the grocery store only then they are allowed to go inside that area same thing happened in the restaurants there will be a place where only the cook and the waiters are allowed and that place is not at all accessible by the people who are going to eat food who are the customers to that particular restaurant here you are able to go inside the store it means you have the access to the store you are able to go inside the restaurant so it means you have access to the restaurant but there are specific things that you are not allowed to do even when you have access to a particular service this is exactly happened with authorization authorization tells you after you gain the access what are the things that you can do what are the things that you cannot do but please remember authorization always comes after authentication that's why i told authorization means it is after you gain the access and you gain the access using authentication that's what we learned just now after you gain the access using authentication then only the system will check what are you supposed to do and what are the things you are not supposed to do and based on that the access will be provided to you that's how the authorization works now let's go back to sam's story again and let's assume that Sam is already authenticated with the previous steps and let's see how Sam can do his authorizations and the access related to that. Here goes Sam again and the server and the database. Now Sam is already authenticated. It means the server is not going to ask Sam's credential again. And remember server has already provided a token to Sam so that Sam doesn't have to provide and key in his credential user ID and password again and again. Now in this situation what Sam is doing, Sam is asking for payroll details and also passing the token so that server knows like hey this is Sam and then server goes back to the database and fetch the user data. Remember server is not fetching the payroll data here, server is fetching the user data. Why? Because server wants to know what are the rights that Sam has on this application. Am I really allowed to give Sam the payroll details? Sam does have the access or Sam doesn't have the access. To know that server is fetching this particular user details, Sam's details from the database. Database gives the details back and then server does some computation. All right, he's asking for a payroll details and this is what I got from the database. Look like Sam may have the access so let's fetch payroll and then database gives back the payroll data and Sam gives back the, gets back the payroll data. This is how it happened. But think about a situation where the computation happened and it figures out that Sam is not supposed to access the payroll data at all. In that case, what will happen? Sam will get a no access. Sam will get like, hey, you authenticated. That's great. You are able to access the server that is gate, but you are not authorized to the payroll data. You do not have access to the payroll data. So this is how the authorization works. Even if you have access to the service, but a part of service, you may not be authorized to access. That's what the authorization means. There are various ways you can achieve authorization. For example, we learned authentication can be achieved with single factor and multi-factor. The authorization can be achieved through different mechanisms. For example, role-based access control or RBAC. What exactly it means? It means that in the service or in the server or in the application every user should have certain role for example there will be somebody who is administrator so it means the person is super powered should be able to do many things that other normal users shouldn't be able to do 
this person can create another user this person can delete another user this person can do all sort sort of thing but a normal user maybe should be able to only view things should be only able to like things comment things but not something beyond that so it means in the application itself you are defining the role who is going to admin who is going to customer who is going to this user that user and based on that you are providing certain permissions so role will have permissions and then the role will have these users so the user belong to a particular role will automatically inherit the permission that belongs to that role so for example there will be a role called administrator administrator will have certain permission that create a user delete a user modify a user create this service delete this service bunch of permission now if i add say tom to administrator role Tom will automatically have all the permission that belongs to this administrator role. Similarly, the organization will create many roles and through these roles, it will do the access control. So when Tom try to log into the application, we will fetch from the database what is the role and permission that Tom has. Based on that, we'll allow Tom to do things. It will be different for Harry. It will be different for Tapas. So the role-based access control is a way where you can control authorization there are a few other ways for example there is something called attribute based access control so this is little bit more powerful for example not only you are looking into the roles and permission you are also looking into some of the attributes of the user who is trying to authorize so for example you know a certain user only comes in the night shift now if the user is trying to access something into the daytime the login time is a daytime the system might raise an alarm saying that hey this person should should not be at the daytime at all because this person only has the night shift now along with the roles along with the permissions this particular attribute that when the person is supposed to log in also will come into picture to provide a certain access into the service so you're getting how the things are getting granular so role based on top of that we can do also attribute based there are also another thing is called policy based so the organization can have different policies like they can define policies and based on those policies you can gain access to certain services to implement author authentication and authorization you got to know few concepts for example what is the concept of cookie or what is jwt or what is OAuth or what is open id so these are the mechanism through which you can perform the authentication and authorization using program what happened is like either you understand each of this mechanism and implement the authentication and authorization in your application or you take help of a third party tool like Auth0 or NextAuth or anything like that which have already done this for you or Firebase which is already done for you and then you use that as a library or a tool in your application and do the authentication or authorization. So these are the things that you need to now start exploring with the knowledge of authentication and authorization that you got. I'm very excited to let you know that I want to do a video on JWT and the JWT authentication from the scratch the how it happens and how it works cookie based i will definitely touch base in that video but i'm not going to implement it because it's a little bit backdated so stay tuned to that video but you yourself with the things that you have learned so far please go ahead and start reading about authentication authorization and all this mechanism cookies jwt oauth open ids at least have some idea by the time the video comes out are there more such things as part of full stack development like authorization and authentication i bet they are you have things like caching, you have things like performance, you have things like scalability, you have things like even accessibility, you have things like even designing. So full stack engineering is just not about connecting your back end to your front end. There are more things to it. When you are hired as a full stack engineer, you are supposed to know some of these peripherals. Whether you are focusing on UI, focusing on API, focusing on backend, you are supposed to take care of things like authentication, authorization, caching, accessibility of things, performance of the things, idea about scalability, knowing about deployment, knowing about infrastructure. You ha should have that idea as a full stack engineer. So I hope this video was useful to you and you learn something about authentication and authorization if you were not aware of it before. And I'm sure like if you pick up a topic like, hey, how to integrate authentication and authorization library with Nexus, now you have the background of doing that. So that is easy for you. I will keep teaching you concepts like this, for example, caching or maybe performance or maybe scalability, all this concept, the similar way that we have done in this video for authentication and authorization. So stay tuned to that. If you like this video, please do a like and share share and please 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 subscribe to my channel i'll be coming back very soon with another video take a great care of yourself and stay happy